The internment of the Japanese in North America has long been regarded as a grave breach both of American constitutional law and of Canadian human rights. It remains buried in our history books as a shameful scar that cannot be denied. The internment of the Japanese immigrants and their children had become the greatest mass movement in Canadian history. In America, this happened of course at a time of national outrage. Nearly two and a half months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's executive order was fueled by anti-Japanese sentiment amongst farmers who competed against the Japanese labor, and politicians who sided with the public hysteria brought on by the attack on Pearl Harbor. There was a very real, if unrealistic fear, that Pearl Harbor was the prelude to a Japanese invasion of the American Pacific Coast. People of Japanese ancestry were assembled by force, uprooted from their homes and brought to assembly centers that were constructed in public racetracks and fairgrounds. Horse stalls had been converted into makeshift apartments and internees were instructed to fill up a bag with straw for a mattress. The newly interned Japanese were being treated like livestock as they awaited their relocation to the internment camps that were currently being constructed on federally owned lands. All civil liberties were ignored. Imprisonment and relocation was conducted without any accusations or charges against the Japanese Americans. It is strangely interesting that in Canada, similar evacuation orders were established with far less merit. The Canadian Federal Government and British Columbia Security Commission moved swiftly to displace the hard-working farmers and fishermen from the coastal regions. This movement was based solely on their ethnicity. To this day, no group of people in Canadian history have experienced as much hardship and upheaval as the Japanese Canadians during their time of internment. Their ordeal began on the 8th of December 1941, the day after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Within hours of the attack, Ottawa had ordered that all fishing boats operated by Japanese Canadian fishermen be impounded and that all Japanese aliens be registered with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. In March of 1942, the hardest blow was delivered. In following Theodore Roosevelt's executive order, William Lyon Mackenzie King announced in the House of Commons that all Japanese Canadians would be forcibly removed from the Pacific Coast to safeguard the defenses of the Pacific Coast of Canada. Two bags is all that they were allowed to pack, without any indication of how long they would be gone or if they would ever return. Japanese Canadians were then uprooted from their homes, stripped of their personal property, and ordered to report to assembly centers with no more than they could carry. Hastings Park, the site of the annual fall exhibition and racetrack, became the coordinating point for their assembly and internment. Due to severe overcrowding, some were permitted to remain in their homes under strict curfew to await their relocation. The only reasoning they were given was that the internment was for their own protection. In the United States, internment camps were overcrowded and provided living conditions that were below standard even for hardened criminals in federal penitentiaries. Internees were monitored by armed guards and housed behind barbed wire. They lived in tar-papered covered barracks of simple frame construction with wooden floors and no insulation. The internees lived through intense heat in the summers and extreme cold through the winters. Some were forced to wear all of the clothing they owned just to survive. Despite their physical hardships, families in the United States were generally kept together. In Canada, the male evacuees were sent far from their loved ones to work on sugar beet farms and road camps. The war effort had reduced the manpower required to maintain the industries, and the men provided the labor as cost-effective replacements. The women and children were forced to struggle for survival in the abandoned mining towns of the British Columbia interior. 
The burned out, dilapidated structures provided minimal shelter and created unethical challenges considered to be torturous today. Although many braved the winters, some were unable to survive their internment. Relocation experiences seem to affect the internees in significant and often devastating ways. The children faced difficult and oppressing times in the camps as they were too young to understand the barbed wire and armed guards. They were accused of no crimes and they were not charged with anything. Their only offense was that their parents or grandparents were born in Japan. By 1944, President Roosevelt rescinded Executive Order 9066, and the last camp was closed by the end of 1945. The Japanese-American internees were now free to return to their neighborhoods, where they were now unwelcome and seen as the enemy. They were faced with increased racism and segregation as they attempted to pick up the pieces and start their lives over. The Japanese Canadians, unlike their counterparts in the United States, were detained until the end of the war. Even after the conclusion of hostilities, the internees were barred from ever returning home. The internees were provided with two options. They were to keep moving east and disperse elsewhere in Canada, or face deportation to war-ravaged Japan. Most of the younger internees were born in Canada and were Canadian citizens. Several had never even been to Japan, so the threat of a deportation order was not only terrifying to them, but unusually cruel. In 1988, the Canadian government admitted to its wrongdoings three decades too late. Prime Minister Brian Mulroney issued formal apologies on behalf of the federal government and awarded restitution in the sum of $21,000 to the remaining Japanese Canadian survivors. $21,000 in exchange for your freedom, for your human rights, for all of your possessions, and for the trauma of the children prisoners that committed no wrongs. Can any dollar amount ever return that which was lost? Was there ever any reason to look in the direction of these people as the gravest possible threat to our security? Or were these orders simply fueled by racism against a visible minority? It shall remain to be a never-ending source of hurt for the Japanese Canadians and Americans alike. We must remember that this scar is carved deep into our national heritage for succeeding generations to be made aware of and for them never to forget. Thank you.